mid-November, elements of the U.S. 6th Army Group drove rapidly towards Strasbourg, a French city situated on the banks of the Rhine. On the 23rd of November, the French 2nd Armored Division reached Strasbourg. But the city was not completely won until four days later, after a bitter Nazi defense. With Germany in view just across the Rhine, the Allied forces in Strasbourg redoubled their attack against the Nazis on the opposite shore in the little German town of Kiel. Meanwhile, the 44th and 79th American divisions made swift progress toward Agano to the north against stubborn resistance. The enemy was not quitting France without a fight. surrendered at Agano on December 12th. Allow any Germans to remain west of the river in the upper Rhine plain would be certain to cause us later embarrassment. All along the Allied front, the men began to show the effects of the months of battle strain. As the infantry replacement problem became acute, we resorted to every kind of expedient to keep units up to strength. All these measures, however, failed to keep filled the ranks of the infantry formations. As winter approached, the Allied commanders were faced with added problems. The infantry, which in all kinds of warfare habitually absorbs the bulk of the losses, is now taking practically all of them. These were by no means due to enemy action alone. In other respects, too, the infantry suffered an abnormal percentage of casualties. Because of exposure, the cases of frostbite, trench foot, and respiratory diseases were far more numerous among infantry soldiers than others. To keep those casualties to a minimum, every precaution possible was taken against the spread of these afflictions. Maintenance of morale was a problem of first importance. We established divisional centers in the rear of the lines where a company or a battalion could occasionally get out of the fighting zone and the men could secure baths, warm beds, and a day or two of rest. The effect of prolonged combat is always bad. If a unit is brought out of line before the processes of physical and mental fatigue have gone too far, it can be ready for re-entry into battle far sooner than one that has been kept in line too long. Moreover, periodic rest for the frontline soldier have a splendid effect upon morale. And in any kind of warfare, troop morale is always a decisive factor. During World War I, the American Army had received recreation and entertainment assistance from a variety of civilian organizations. We depended upon the USO and the Red Cross. The services of these devoted people to soldiers in the field were beyond praise. We also established a furlough plan, which gave at least some men the opportunity to go back to Paris. To help make the GIs stay in the city as enjoyable as possible, the Red Cross opened several allied clubs, which proved a haven for soldiers confused by a strange language. But the foreign flavor of Paris had a universal appeal to visiting GIs and those lucky enough to be stationed there. To a combat soldier, a trip to the French capital seemed like a visit to another world. A 10-day pass in Paris worked wonders in terms of the GI's morale, an especially important factor at this critical time. By mid-December 1944, the Allies had penetrated the German border in the Aachen sector and were threatening to push the entire battle line into Germany. Hitler realized some months earlier that only by a large-scale counterattack could Germany regain the initiative and stave off final defeat a little longer. During the early autumn, the Führer called in his top military advisers, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, Chief of Staff of the Supreme Command, 
equivalent to the Minister of War, and Colonel General Alfred Yodel, Chief of the Armed Forces Operations Staff. They analyzed the situation on all fronts to the most minute degree to determine the best place to attack the Allies in the West with the limited resources available. To carry out the heavy attack, Hitler mustered all the divisions he could spare on other fronts and speeded induction of young German youth. To strengthen the morale of the Nazi troops, there were more frequent decoration ceremonies. No attack was too difficult to a young German soldier who had just received an award for valor from a high-ranking Nazi commander. As autumn waned, the forces which were to make the attack were secretly massed. The Nazi command had finally decided on the Ardennes region as the area to attack. Preparations were rushed so the assault could be started before the end of the year. The Nazis hoped to isolate important Allied supply routes, like the Albert Canal, which linked Liège, just behind the Allied front, with Antwerp and the sea. If the enemy seized Liège, key maintenance and communication center feeding the Allied 12th Army Group, the Allied force on that front would be seriously crippled. Allied supply centers all the way to the coast were the principal objectives of the Nazi commanders. They hoped thus to make the whole Allied supply position virtually untenable and at the same time split the Allied forces in two. With supply centers cut off, Allied hopes for an early victory would be considerably dim. The German attack started after preparations had been completed in the greatest secrecy on December 16th. It was a blow of staggering proportions. The Nazis employed three armies for the assault, totaling some 14 infantry and 10 panzer divisions. The morning of December 17th, it became clear that the German attack was in great strength. The enemy was employing considerable armor and was progressing rapidly to the westward. In two important points, the enemy had gained definite surprise. The first of these was in time. We had believed that he could not be ready for a major assault as early as he was. The other point in which he surprised us was the strength of the attack. On the morning of December 17th, two gaps were torn through our line. When the U.S. 7th Armored Division came down from the northern flank on December 17th, the situation was still far from clear. It pushed forward to support the left of the 8th Corps and became semi-isolated in saint vite saint vite was an important point on the road net of that area and necessary to the enemy. Finally, the continued and heavy pressure of the Germans tended further to isolate the 7th Armored. A concentrated attack by several divisions on December 20th drove it to the west in the area north of saint vite Consequently, it was ordered to withdraw the next day to join the Allied lines, which were now building up on the north flank of the German salient. But the great stand of the division had badly upset the enemy's timetable. Thereafter, with three proved and battle-tested units, the 1st, 2nd and 9th Divisions holding the position, the safety of our northern shoulder was practically a certainty. The withdrawal was covered by tanks only since the thickening weather excluded any possibility of air support. The Allies' principal problem was to keep the bulge from widening on the flanks. However far the Nazis' central thrust carried them, they must be prevented from expanding to the north and south. Beginning late in December, the Allies launched a counteroffensive with the U.S. 3rd Army attacking from the south and later the 1st Army from the north. On the northern flank, all Allied ground forces were placed under the operational command of Field Marshal Montgomery. This group included the major part of the U.S. 1st Army and the U.S. 9th Army, commanded by Lieutenant General William Simpson. I radioed Montgomery saying, our weakest spot is in direction of Namur. The general plan is to plug the holes in the north and launch coordinated attack from the south. 
Across the bulge, General Bradley was suitably located to command the forces on the southern flank of the salient, consisting mainly of the U.S. Third Army. It was Bradley's responsibility to outline the exact unit sectors together with other local details of direction and cooperation. I issued verbal orders for Patton's attack under Bradley to begin no later than December 23rd. It was arranged for Patton to concentrate his attacking corps of three divisions in the general vicinity of Arlong. The German attack made rapid progress through the center of the salient. During the first weeks of the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans took several thousand American prisoners and promptly took advantage of the opportunity to stock up on the highly prized American cigarettes. After years of smoking inferior Nazi cigarettes, the German soldiers were grateful for the change. Though under constant Nazi attack, Bastogne was successfully defended by the 101st Airborne Division, led by Generals Anthony McAuliffe and Maxwell Taylor, who returned to the command of his division during the Bastogne siege. The defense of Bastogne was not only a spectacular feat of arms, but had a great effect upon the outcome of the battle. Bastogne lay in the general path of the sector of advance of the German 5th Panzer Army. On December 19th, the 101st prepared to defend Bastogne. That morning, we did not know whether Bastogne was yet surrounded, but the strength and direction of advance of German troops in that area indicated that it quickly would be. Consequently, the 101st Division prepared for all-round defense, and although the assaulting armored divisions of the Germans bypassed it to participate in the attack to the northwest, the division was under constant pressure from other German units from that moment onward until relieved. One of the breaks in our favor occurred on December 23rd. This was a sudden, temporary clearing of the weather in the forward areas, which released our air forces to plunge into the battle. The important road center of Bastogne could not have been held by the 101st Division during the German counteroffensive in December 1944, except for the airplanes that delivered 800,000 pounds of supplies to the division during the critical days between the 23rd and 27th of December. By early January, the real danger to the Allied position had passed. And the exhausting process of pushing the enemy back to his former line began. Patton's third army had cut a corridor through the German-held territory to beleaguered Bastogne. Additional reserves were brought up to strengthen the new Allied offensive which hammered the retreating Nazis continuously. The ground for which the enemy had fought so bitterly and paid such a heavy price was once again in the hands of the Allied armies. The German Air Force had come out in the strongest attack it had attempted against us in months. Reaction of our own planes was swift. The enemy lost almost half his entire attacking force. Two days later, the First Army began its attacks on the northern flank and all danger from the great German thrust had disappeared. From that moment on, it was merely a question of whether we could make sufficient progress through his defenses and through the snowbanks of the Ardennes to capture or destroy significant portions of his forces. From both flanks, we continued attacks in the direction of Upalis, where we joined up on January 16th. With the meeting of the U.S. Third and First Armies at Upalis, north of Baston, the gap was closed and the Battle of the Bulge was ended. Both armies turned eastward and continued the drive to push the Nazis back into the heart of their country. 
But the going was slow on the icy terrain. The motorized vehicles, which could function in almost every type of country, had never had quite the problem they faced as the Allies plodded eastward in miserable fighting weather. First and third armies continued eastward to drive the Germans beyond their initial lines. The losses on both sides in the Battle of the Ardennes were considerable. Our own were high. Altogether, we calculated our losses at a total of 77,000 men, of whom about 8,000 were killed, 48,000 wounded, and 21,000 captured or missing. The enemy suffered serious casualties in tanks, assault guns, planes, and motor transport. These we estimated at 600 tanks and assault guns, 1,600 planes, and 6,000 other vehicles. Field commanders estimated that in the month ending January 16th, the enemy suffered 120,000 serious casualties. In view of the fact that after the war, German commanders admitted a loss of about 90,000, this estimate of our own would seem to be fairly accurate. I wanted to pass to the general offensive as quickly as possible, because I was convinced that in the Battle of the Bulge, the enemy had committed all of his remaining reserves. I counted on a greatly weakened resistance because of the widespread discouragement that I felt sure would overtake the German army. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.